to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 22, verse number 16. We welcome you today to our second part of our series on objections to baptism, looking at the study of baptism itself. And so we're so glad that you've joined us today. As always, if you don't have your Bible out and ready, we want you to pause for just a moment, find your Bible, get it ready, as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study of this subject. We're happy that you've joined us for our study today, and uh, we want to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ, in your area. These messages are being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit with them, whether it be for their services on Sunday or Wednesday. You'll find people there who love God who are warm and friendly and kind, who'd be happy to sit down and discuss the scriptures with you, and who are just concerned about men and women going to heaven. And so visit the church in your area. If you'd like to study more on any subject, they'd be happy to do that. And friend, we'd also like to help you in your journey to know God and his word better here at the gospel of Christ. Our emphasis and our motive is just simply to help men and women go to heaven. We want the Word of God to be out at the forefront, and we want a thus saith the Lord to override everything that we say and do. And so we encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our material free of charge. We've got lessons in the Old Testament, New Testament, Lots of topical lessons on all the subjects you might think of, a variety of subjects there, transcripts, study questions, articles, just a good variety of Bible study material, and it's all free, available to you free of charge from our website. If you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons uh, on DVD or CD, we can make that available to you, or if you need it on a computer or for a device, just go to our website, fill out a media request form, indicate how you'd like to receive that, and we can make that available for you as a digital download as well. And friend, we encourage you to check us out on our app, available in the app stores. Great way to keep up with all our latest lessons, what we're doing, stay in contact with us through that way. Today we're thinking about the idea of objections to baptism. Oftentimes, when we present what the Bible says on baptism, whether it be that baptism is for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38, or Jesus said, he that believes and will be baptized will be saved. Or Peter said, baptism does now save us. Mark 16, 16, 1 Peter 3, 21. Often when that material or that information from Scripture is presented, uh, maybe those who won't agree with that or haven't heard it that way or have some prejudice begin to object to what God says and offer reasons for that. And so today we want to answer some of those objections to baptism being for the remission of sins. Here's the next objection that we're dealing with today. Sometimes when people hear what the Bible says about baptism being for salvation, people say something like, well, yeah, may I see that, but Peter said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord to be saved, all you got to do is call on the name of the Lord, and whoever calls on Jesus' name will be saved. And verses like, Acts chapter 2, verse 21, are mentioned. Friend, listen carefully. Do we believe that calling on the name of the Lord is essential to salvation? Absolutely. But what we're asking today is, what does it actually mean to call on the name of the Lord? Are there any examples in the Bible of how 
people were told to call the name of the Lord. The phraseology, call on the name of the Lord, implies that we have a need. That need is we are lost in sin, we are headed down the path to destruction, and man cries out to God to save him. Whatever God tells us to do to be saved means we respond properly and have called on the name of the Lord correctly. Well, how do you? According to the Bible, letting the Bible be its own best and divine commentary, how does one call on the name of the Lord? I want you to open your Bible to Acts chapter 22. Verse number 16 with me. Here is a divine commentary on how a person calls on the name of the Lord. The context is Ananias is now coming to Saul of Tarsus who has been waiting to hear a message from God about salvation. Now Ananias comes to him. And look in verse 16. Ananias says to him, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Listen now. Calling on the name of the Lord. What did Paul have to do? What did Saul of Tarsus have to do to call on the name of the Lord? Well, he had to get up and he had to be baptized, have his sins washed away in baptism, and that's how Paul called on the name of the Lord. Friend, when we think about this idea, man cries out to God, God extends the lifeline in Jesus and lays out what he must do to be saved. If I call on the name of the Lord, I'm going to be saved because I'm going to do what God tells me to do. And friend, hear it well. The divine commentary on how to call on the name of the Lord means that you must get up and do what God says to be saved, which includes being baptized to have your sins washed away. Now friend, let me mention this as well. Did you catch that little phrase there in verse 16 of Acts 22? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. You see, it's at the point of baptism that we contact the death of Jesus. Romans 6, 3, and 4 were buried with him in baptism into his death. It is the blood, it is the death, and it is the sacrifice of Jesus that washes away our sins. We contact that when we're baptized, buried with Christ in baptism into his death. If sin separates me from God, and it does. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Here's man, here's God. There is a big separation in the middle. That separation is sin. If I can know when that line is removed and God, or man, God and man are brought back together, I can know the very second in time, moment in time, I'm saved, right? Our sins are washed away when we're baptized, buried with Christ in baptism, into his death, Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. And so to say that baptism's not essential and that it's not important to salvation, friend, that's contrary to what the Bible teaches in a multitude of locations. Then there's another objection that is often heard as it relates to baptism. Sometimes I'll hear people say when we talk about baptism that, yeah, but you know it's the sinner's prayer that really saves. Well, does it really? And more importantly, where's the sinner's prayer at in the Bible? The sinner's prayer that many have gone around and said has said something like this, Dear Jesus, I recognize you as Lord and Savior. I now ask you to come into my heart and save me. You know what's interesting about that sinner's prayer? Not even found one time in the Bible. You can read from Genesis 1.1 to Revelation 22, 21, and you will never once find that sinner's prayer anywhere in the Bible. In fact, what you do find is that there were sinners who prayed and still had to do what God said to be saved. Let me illustrate. Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus is blinded on the road to Damascus. Uh, he is told to go wait, and one of God's servants is going to come to him. And in verses 11 and 12 of Acts chapter 9, the Bible says, So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight. Inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Listen now. For behold, he is praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Friend, if there were ever anybody who said a prayer is a sinner, Saul of Tarsus was praying. He knew he was a sinner. He was blinded by the light. 
Yet, Saul of Tarsus still had to do what God said to be saved other than just pray. Ananias, as we just mentioned, came to him, told him to arise and be baptized and to wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Here's a man, here's a sinner who was praying. If anybody was ever praying a sinner's prayer, he definitely would have been praying as a sinner. And yet he still had to get up and be baptized and have his sins washed away. I remember one time I was preaching in a location and I'd preach that you can't find the sinner's prayer anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere does it say that it saves. And I remember right after that lesson, a lady made a beeline to me. She came right up to me. And she said, preacher, she said, I heard what you said about the sinner's prayer. I said, yes, ma'am. You can't find that anywhere in the Bible. That's not taught in scripture. It's just nowhere in there. She said, I'm going to go home and ask my pastor about that. I said, well, you go home and ask him whatever verses he gives you. You bring them back and tomorrow night we'll talk about them. So the next night, she comes back to the meeting. As soon as she gets there, makes a beeline up to me. She said, preacher, she said, I went home, asked my pastor if the sinner's prayer was in the Bible. He said, you was right. And I told him he is a liar. Now, friend, it isn't about me or him. That's not the idea. But the truth is this. You can't preach that from God. You cannot preach that little prayer saves and say right here, book, chapter, and verse is the verse that says, Pray this little prayer and you'll be saved. It's just not the way it works. You don't find that in the Bible. That objection cannot hold water because it's not based on the truth of God's word. Let's then consider another objection. Sometimes people object when we talk about baptism by saying you're putting too much emphasis on baptism when it's the blood of Jesus that saves. We're saved by Jesus' blood, not baptism. Friend, please understand what we're saying. Is it absolutely the blood of Jesus that saves? It absolutely is. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus has washed us in his blood and saved us. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And so please understand, it is absolutely the blood of Jesus that saves. But here's the question. His death, his blood, and his sacrifice, can it be accessed outside of baptism? Open your Bible to Romans chapter 6 with me, and I want you to see that the way the Bible teaches we access the blood and the death and the sacrifice of Jesus is when we are buried with Christ in baptism. Listen to Romans 6 verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, hear this, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Yes, it's the death of Jesus that saves. Yes, it's his blood and his sacrifice. But friend, do you not see that the blood and death and sacrifice of Jesus are linked together with where we contacted at? And that's in the waters of baptism. When we reenact that death, that burial in water and that rising up out of that water, the gospel has become effective in our lives. And so we're not overemphasizing or underemphasizing anything. We're showing the connection between the death of Jesus and a person accessing that in the waters of baptism when he's buried with Christ in baptism. And so the Bible links the two together. We shouldn't unlink them if that's what the Word of God itself does. Another objection that I sometimes hear about baptism is this. Sometimes people will say, Jesus could not have been baptized for the remission of sins because he was sinless. Therefore, people today are not baptized in order to be forgiven. They're merely imitating the example of Jesus. Well, the objection itself shows a stark contrast, does it not? It clearly says, Jesus was sinless. He was not baptized for the same reason that we are. And so the comparison is, to begin with, not a fair comparison. We're comparing Jesus who was sinless with all who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And on top of that, we just have to consider what the Bible says about baptism for us. I want to imitate the example of Jesus as much as anybody else, but comparing Jesus, who is sinless, 
with what the Bible says about sinners and baptism today really is not a fair comparison. You see, the Bible says all of us have sinned. I'm not in that same class that we're talking about with Jesus. Romans 3 verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. But more importantly than that, we've got to start listening to what the Bible does say about baptism. It says baptism is for the remission of sins. Acts 2 verse 38. It says, a, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3 verse 5. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark 16, 16. And Peter so clearly said, baptism does now also save us. And so when we consider the difference between me and Jesus and what the Bible does say, all men must do, really this objection doesn't come to amount to a lot when we factor these ideas in. Sometimes I'll hear people say, as we relate to the objections of the Bible, uh, sometimes I'll hear people say something like, well, maybe, but here, here's what I know. A person is saved the moment he accepts Christ as his personal Savior, which precedes and excludes water baptism. All you've got to do is accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Well, friend, again, let, let, let's, let's let the Bible speak on that. I want to be saved, and I know Jesus came to save all of us. He, he, he tasted death for every man. There's the personal nature of that. He's the propitiation for our sins, not for ours alone, the sins of the whole world. There, there's a personal sense in that, no doubt. But the Bible doesn't say. The Bible does not say a person saved the moment he accepts Christ as his personal Savior. Do I understand there are passages that teach about belief? Sure I do. John 3, 16, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the book of Acts, on occasion, people will be told, believe on the Lord Jesus, you and your household, and you will be saved. Acts chapter 16. And yet, there are passages that also teach, to be saved, a person must repent. Repent and be converted. Acts 3, 19, unless you repent, You'll all likewise perish, Luke 13, 3. There are passages that teach, I've got to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Jesus said, if you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. If you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And yes, there are passages that clearly teach you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved, Mark 16, 16. And so the idea that all you've got to do is believe. That's not dealing fairly with what the Bible says. You've got to put, listen to this, Psalm 119, uh, I believe verse 160 says, the sum of God's word is true. That means the totality. We put everything God says together on the subject of salvation and what I must do to be saved. Then we can know what God tells us to do as it relates to his plan for mankind today. An objection that I often hear and somewhat we can definitely all probably relate to in some ways, not making it right or wrong, is this. Sometimes in teaching somebody the gospel and we get down to the moment of decision and maybe they, they know that truth and they might object to being baptized by saying, if I do this, I'll just have condemned my whole family to hell. Friend, let me say a couple of things about that. Number one, nothing you do, nothing you, what you don't do or do, nothing you can or cannot do can condemn your family to hell. You don't have that power and authority. I don't have that power and authority. Only God has that power and authority. And then secondly, all you can do is obey now what you know now. People, other people will be responsible for their decisions. They'll stand before God and be judged. You have to give an account. I have to give an account based on what I know the Bible teaches and what I know I need to do to be saved. And then, friend, can I remind you of an example in the Bible? I want you to think about a man. 
Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. There was a man on the other side, and he wasn't on the good side. But that man, he had one final request to Father Abraham. He said this, Father Abraham, I've got five brothers. Please send someone to warn them not to come to this place. Friend, I promise you, loved ones, they want us to obey the gospel. People who've gone on before us, regardless, they want us to obey the gospel. I respond, what I do or don't do isn't going to condemn anybody to hell. I can only obey what I know the Bible teaches, and my loved ones, I will guarantee you from the other side, their desire is for us to obey the gospel, become a Christian, and submit to what God teaches on the subject of baptism. As you think about the idea of objections to baptism that are still given today, sometimes I still hear this one. Sometimes people say, well, you know, Saul was saved before uh, and without baptism while he was on the road to Damascus when Jesus appeared to him. Again, I understand Jesus spoke to We understand Jesus spoke to Saul. We understand that Christ presented to him with that great bright light. He was blinded. Somebody had to lead him to the hand. We know that according to Acts 9, 11, and 12, he was there praying until Ananias came. But to say Saul was saved before and without baptism while he was on the road to Damascus, friend, that's not what the Bible says, nor is that what the Bible clearly teaches. How do we know that? A person is saved when that person's sins are removed and he's brought back in a relationship with Almighty God. Ananias still had to come to Saul, and he told Saul this, get up, why are you waiting? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. Call on the name of the Lord. Saul of Tarsus was not saved on the road to Damascus. He was still in sin until Ananias came to him and told him what he needed to do to have his sins washed away and how to call on the name of the Lord according to the scripture. And so my friend, here's what we ask you today. There's a lot of different folks in the religious world who teach a lot of different things about salvation. There is a host of error that is taught about baptism. In this series of lessons, we have addressed what the Bible says the purposes of baptism are and we have addressed the objections that some often offer for not accepting what that truth is. And while our intent is simply to help people know the gospel, friend, there's more of a personal desire with that as well. We want to ask you today to look into your own life, into your own heart, and ask yourself, have I really obeyed what God teaches? on this subject? Did you really understand what you were doing? You know, a lot of folks are baptized so young, they just don't have a clue really what they were doing. Maybe they didn't have the maturity or the knowledge. Some people were taught wrong. You can't be taught wrong and baptized right. Why? You've got to know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth will make you free. John 8, verse 32. And so maybe you were, maybe you were too young. Maybe you were taught wrong. Maybe you, maybe you never really were taught, and maybe you've never obeyed the gospel. Friend, what a great opportunity this is to obey what your Lord and Savior says. You see, it is Jesus who saves. You'll call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 19 through 21. He's able to save to the uttermost. Those who, comes to, those who come to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7, verse 25 and 26. Jesus tasted death for every man. He tasted death for me. The Bible teaches that he's the propitiation for my sins, but not mine alone, for the sins of the whole world. And friend, the Bible teaches that if I will obey Christ, if I will follow him, and if I'll live faithful to him, I can have a home in heaven. And so today, consider 
what God teaches about the plan of salvation. Have you heard the word of God? Romans 10 verse 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Do you really believe that message? I'm talking about believe it to the point that you are making a life commitment to follow Jesus no matter what. Jesus said, unless you do that, unless you believe that I am he, you'll surely die in your sins. Would you turn from a life of sin? My friend, we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But would you do your best to turn from that? Peter said, repent and turn again. Repentance is a 180 degree turn from a life of sin to a turn into doing what God wants us to do. Having repented, would you make that great confession? I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. And having done all that to contact the death of Jesus, would you be buried with Christ in baptism into his death? If it's his death that saves, I need to let Christ bury me into that death with him in baptism. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. But it doesn't end there. We rise out of that watery grave of baptism, as Paul says, to walk in newness of life. I live different. I think different. My priorities are different. I look up. I have the hope and the joy of heaven. The things of this world are not the things where my interest is. I've truly given my life to Almighty God. And so, friend, does that speak of you today? Have you done those things? If you haven't done those things, can we kindly say, to you, what Ananias said to Saul of Tarsus. Why are you waiting? If you know the truth and you know what you need to do, why are you waiting? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Don't just plan on doing it, do it. And so friend, we hope you'll join us next time as we're gonna study more on the wonderful subject of what does the Bible teach on baptism. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.